there, there was already some good um, uh, evidence, biological evidence to justify the study. Because you're right, there's nobody, because we did need to get a lot of regulatory approval to do this. Uh, yeah. and, and the bodies that do that, like the in, the in our case, it's called the Institutional Review Board in the United States. I mean, especially because I think this is probably one of the most exciting papers that I've read this year, at least. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Luis Garza, Associate Professor of Dermatology at John Hopkins School of Medicine, where his lab combines clinical expertise in wound care with groundbreaking research on skin stem cells and regeneration. Here we talk about his innovative research in tissue regeneration, especially focusing on a very exciting and interesting study that came out recently. I hope you enjoy. So yeah, I have like so many questions for you, but I thought I should firstly take a step back and discuss um, the fact that you're a dermatologist and I guess I'm just interested in why you're so fascinated about skin. Yeah, yeah. So um, for me, I, um, I did my PhD um, in metabolism and uh, biochemistry and um, we were working a lot on adipocytes and it was a lot of fun, but I was jealous of my friends that were doing skin research because it was so easy to see that organ and 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 study it. Um, and I realized that um, during the end of my PhD that that um, skin biology is really fun because you can ask um, most questions of biology in that realm. So you can use it as a crucible to kind of ask larger questions that are relevant for wider areas in biology and medicine. And so I was fundamentally really excited about the science of uh, dermatology. And then I got interested in the clinical practice too, because it's very compatible with doing research. So some physician scientists who do like surgery, for example, it's got to, it has to be terribly hard for them to combine any research interest with a extremely um, demanding clinical um, responsibilities that, that are unpredictable. Uh, but the great thing about dermatology is uh, the acuity of our patients tends to be somewhat lower um, and the schedule is much more predictable um, so that it's easier to combine uh, with research. Um, so I enjoyed the clinical practice of dermatology and I really enjoyed the scientific opportunities that it presented. Uh, and that, that's why I ended up um, studying dermatology and doing my uh, residency and postdoc in that area. I see. And so tell me more about the skin. What are some of the major functions of the skin? As I guess many people think of it more maybe as aesthetic sort of part of you, but obviously it also plays very important roles uh, within the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great point. Yeah. The skin, it's pretty dynamic. I mean, its most fundamental role is keeping things from the, on the outside out and things on the inside in. Um, but beyond that, um, there's a lot of other functions. Um, I think it's it's but, but the second probably most important function to me might be immune surveillance. Um, so as um, the organ, as the organ that uh, has um, maybe the widest kind of area exposure to the body, uh, to the outside world, um, rather um, means that you have to be able to um, quickly monitor for any potential threats to the body and so i think the immune system of the skin is extremely robust so it has a very strong innate immune system um, but it's really also important in thermal regulation uh, in sensation like you can you know you can feel a, a single hair moving in your skin so well because um, the nerve innovations are so great um, the thermal regulation is part of how we even evolved as humans it's thought that um, by converting hair follicles to sweat glands uh, we were able to evolve into the Homo sapien species and um, spread into different ecosystems in Africa and eventually kind of conquest the entire world. So a lot of that um, evolution was probably actually based on skin changes. Um, so um, uh, and then and there's there's a host there's also some other other ones like it's involved in uh, oxygen sensing for example, um, and um, and of course. A, a, a variety of other smaller functions, but those are the primary ones. Mm, I see. And I think because it'll be relevant for later on, in terms of the structure of the skin, um, obviously uh, some people might know about the different layers, but what types of cells or structures might be found within the skin? Yeah, so the um, outer, there, there's, th there's two main layers of skin. There's the epidermis, which is the top layer, and the dermis, which is the bottom layer. 
and there's also a third layer kind of deeper than that that we call the hypodermis. Um, and, um, they, and so all, all those layers, of course, are, are relevant. Um, the top layer of, care, of epidermis is composed of keratinocytes. Uh, that's the primary cell there. Um, and the keratinocytes make keratin. Um, and that keratin is basically um, a fundamental, it's like a steel cable that um, helps connect cells and gives cells structural support. Um, and the keratins eventually become like our teeth and our nail and like the horn of like a, um, of like a, of, of an animal um, or um, are those, those structures, generally speaking, are all keratinized structures like hair, uh, nails, uh, teeth, horns. Um, and then below the epidermis is the dermis, and that's composed of fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts, the primary uh, product from them is collagen. Um, and so in the dermis, when we wear leather shoes, we're, wear, we're wearing the, the dermis of a cow. Um, and then... Um, and then the hypodermis is can, the main kind of unique component there are adipocytes, which are also very important for uh, skin function. Um, so those are the three main layers. And then of course there's different structures that um, are in different parts of the body, like hair follicles um, um, help, you know, are most obviously on our scalp, but are really all, all over our body um, are thought to provide um, maybe thermal regulation and also have other roles um, that we're only beginning to understand, um, like in immunity, for example. Um, and then there's sweat glands, which uh, produce sweat, of course, like they're called eccrine glands. And there's a unique gland called the apocrine gland that's present in the underarms and groin. So those are some of the, the main structures uh, of the skin. Hmm. Thank you. And I, I know that your lab general interest is about regeneration of the skin in response to things like wound repair. And so I guess I'm curious to find out about the general research themes that you are currently interested in in your lab. Yeah, yeah. So we're really interested in regenerative medicine, as you say. Like, uh, for us, the kind of lodestone that points north is the, um, like the salamander, where you can cut off a salamander's arm and it can make an entirely new arm. Mm. Um, and um, what's so cool about that is, you know, why do we need to do a liver transplant or um, a um, kidney transplant. Why can't you just grow a new kidney or liver um, like the salamander grows a new arm? Uh, we know that every cell in our body has the same DNA program that we executed when we were in our mother's womb um, for organogenesis. And so why can't we reactivate those developmental programs in adulthood? There's great examples of that, like for example, in the salamander. And so I think um, that animates us, that kind of excites us to say, um, how can we find examples of organogenesis in adulthood and try to learn from that to extrapolate on maybe new therapies for people? Um, and so in that realm, we look at a couple of different areas. We are interested in hair follicle regeneration after wounding. So when you have a big wound in the back of a mouse, the keratinocytes crawl across and they patch the hole. And usually that's the end. Um, like in humans, pretty much that's all that happens is we just patch the hole. But in mice, um, they at the very center of the wound, they again reactivate embryogenesis and they can make a new hair follicle um, from scratch, from just the cells kind of crawling, um, organized, self-organizing themselves. Um, and that's that, that we're really excited about that and interested in what are the uh, cues that turn that on um, as an example of organogenesis in adults. Um, the other uh, thing we've looked at is saying, well, if we can't like regenerate like a whole arm in a human, can we at least regenerate that thick skin that we have on our palms and soles at the um, stump site of an amputee, at the distal limb of an amputee? Um, so those are kind of the two rege main regenerative medicine projects we're thinking about now. Yeah, no, it's super cool. And I mean, that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you because I think your research interests in line with my own interests, I guess my interests are more broadly in uh, tissue aging. So how does the body age and I guess things like why does regeneration become less effective with age also sort of factor into that. Um, but to sort of build upon the last point you mentioned, I guess my favorite cell type, if, if one can have a favorite cell type, are fibroblasts because my whole PhD was on uh, senescence. And I know that your lab recently published um, a really great uh, paper on follow fibroblasts, which are fibroblasts found in the soles of the feet and how if you take 
those fibroblasts and put them ectopically into different regions of the body, it could change the, the structure of the surrounding and uh, skin environment. So would you be able to elaborate a bit about uh, what this finding was and why exactly you were doing it? Sure, happy to. Yeah, Eleanor, yeah, it's great to hear about our overlapping interests. Um, yeah, I agree. The fibroblast is fascinating. I think the fibroblast in the last probably, you know, uh, 15, 20 years, we've realized is an extremely dynamic cell type that um, that uh, was excluded from a lot of attention in the previous you know century. Um, where because they all looked very similar to each other, people thought fibroblasts as being this kind of homogenous um, cell type that just created collagen um, to um, make our extracellular matrix. But like you you well know, it's an extremely dynamic uh, population that's actually quite heterogeneous despite its morphological similarity. Um, and there's a lot of really wonderfully exciting biology, I think, that can be uncovered with more research on fibroblasts. Um, like fibroblasts, a lot of times are the source of iPS cells um, that people mm -hmm. use for uh, doing regeneration that a lot of done in Japan where you are now. Um, so I think, um, yeah, that's just an example of like some of its utility and some of the, um, as we learn more of the biology, I think there will be a lot to really gain from it. Um, and um, yeah, we, uh, I agree, it's, it's super fun. We concentrated on using fibroblasts as a mechanism of trying to regenerate that thick skin so um, at the stump site of an amputee, so they have a lot of skin breakdown um, because th there's pressure in places that weren't adapted to have pressure. Um, so we think there was this magical moment, you know, many, you know, millions of years ago when the first aquatic vertebra slapped its fin on the sand. So we were all, you know, a long, long time ago, we were all fish kind of swimming around. Um, and um, that's why like the insides of our bodies is still kind of like the ocean. Um, and, um, you know, our eyes were adapted to really work underwater more than um, an, an above, above land, above water. Um, and so um, we think then there was, when that, when that fin touched the sand, um, that started probably millions and millions of years of evolution of adaptation of pulsatile pressure. Um, and um, because the palms and soles can get huge, enormous amounts of uh, pressure, like kil multiple kilopascals of pressure, like for example, during running. Um, and um, if the body wasn't really adapted to pressure, there could be a lot of damage because of that. Um, and we think that's why we we don't think twice when we put on our shoes every morning or put on our socks because our skin and our feet is so well um, so well evolved to, to balance the needs of the, the friction and the pressure that's occurring. Um, but for an amputee, it's just a, f a flap of skin from their leg. And so it's not adapted to bear pressure the same way. And so they, they have skin breakdown, just like we see pressure ulcers in folks that are, have like, um, uh, have disabilities and required to, and they're bedridden or, or required to be in a wheelchair most of their life. Um, they also get skin breakdown in areas that um, receive pressure because it wasn't, a, they weren't adapted to have pressure in those areas. So we were really curious how to solve that. And fibroblasts were a wonderful candidate to to solve it because there's a had already been done a lot of really beautiful brilliant research on it so back in like the 40s and 50s developmental biologists had done these cool frankenstein experiments where they would swap epidermis and dermis from different animals so they would like a classic one for example is, uh, from a duck and a quail they would take like the epidermis from a duck and the dermis from a quail to make a quack wow. <laughs> instead, of, uh, instead of a duck um and um and they would ask if they recombine those two, two tissue types, what tissue type would win? Um, and they found that it most typically the dermis would win, that the dermis would instruct the epidermis on what to do. Um, of course, I, you know, it's never that simple. There's, there's roles for both, uh, as always in biology, but that the dermis does have a really fundamental role. Uh, and a guy, um, they, they'd even published in the 1960s in the New England Journal of Medicine using a guinea pig where they um, combine different parts to see if they use sole um, dermis and, and different types of epidermis from the body of a guinea pig, which would win. And they found that sole dermis always won also. Mm -hmm. So that really inspired us to look carefully at the, the sole dermis um, as a means to maybe try to imbue some of those properties at the end of a stump site of an amputee. Um, and so we focused on the, the fibroblast, of course, as the number one cell type within the dermis. And, probably the responsible cell type for a lot of those effects. Um, and, and indeed, people had shown previously 
Like, in fact, a, a wonderful plastic surgeon from Japan uh, named Yamaguchi um, had also shown that volar fibroblasts themselves kind of have that property. Um, and so um, we basically, that, that started our interest in using those cells to look at their therapeutic potential. I see. And so um, having read the paper, my understanding is from a single patient, you took their own fibroblasts from the soles of their feet and then put it back into their own uh, thigh tissue. Uh, and then you looked to see how the skin structure changed over time. And then you compared this to taking it from, uh, I guess, a control tissue sample. I think in this case it was the scalp fibroblasts um, to see how that would also affect the skin structure. And remarkably, you see that when you inject fibroblasts from the soles of the feet, it actually thickens the uh, epidermal layer, if I'm correct, um, which therefore, as you just mentioned, shows or suggests that the fibroblasts from the dermis of the feet have some sort of informational way of instructing the uh, thigh epidermis to change morphology. Is that correct, or have I completely butchered your study? <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, beautiful, yeah, 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 beautiful summary. Yeah, that's ex 100% correct, yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So the volar fibroblasts um, did seem to have that effect. We also used an empty vehicle control, um, like, a, a, so we had two different controls, um, and um, the volar fibroblasts did seem to have some unique properties of causing um, several changes on the skin. Um, and what was interesting, like we find out in science a lot, this will ring true to a lot of your listeners and, and viewers, is that uh, as we started this project, we realized we knew less than we thought about the whole area, the whole field in general, where we wanted to ask um, how well can we change the skin to be the type of skin at the palms and soles. But that was predicated on us already knowing the difference on how palm and sole skin is different. And we realized as we started that the field doesn't even really didn't know that well how palm and sole skin was different. Um, so we had to do a lot of characterization of that as well. Um, we and in, in, in addition to that, the field hadn't even considered how um, volar fibroblasts might themselves just have an intrinsic different response to pressure. Um, so um, that's another area that we studied is we took just these volar fibroblasts in a dish and we applied pressure to them like um, in, in a culture dish. Um, and by applying pressure, we found that they responded very differently to pressure um, and that they even look different. So nobody had carefully looked at them and they even migrate differently. Um, they uh, have you know, different patterns of migration where they have this slingshot movement where they, where they uh, how they move through a dish. Um, so they look different, their gene expression is different. At a baseline, they respond to pressure differently. Um, so, uh, so that was exciting. And then when we looked at, um, trying to characterize the volar skin, uh, the palmo plantar skin more carefully, we found that, uh, normally it has a thicker epidermis. That's the best well-known one that you, you described. Um, but it also has the keratinocytes are bigger. Um, they have a bigger cytoplasmic size, uh, in our palms and soles. Um, and then also in the dermis, the collagen is longer. Um, and also there's more elastin uh, present. Um, and a lot of those hadn't been known. So we, um, we first kind of defined that those were all true and normal uh, volar skin. And then we asked if, how, what they look after the cellular therapy. And we found that they were all, there was all some change in the correct direction. They were all, there was also movement towards the volar phenotype after injecting these cells of those endpoints of looking at the, the thickness of the epidermis, but also how the, the cytoplasmic size of the keratinocyte, the length of the collagen, and the amount of the elastin. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I completely agree. Even just the differences in different regions of the skin and how they're different, why they're different, are fascinating questions. Um, and I think the other interesting thing with the study is it, it isn't, it's not, did you do it in mice at any point, but the least what you published was done in humans as an initial clinical trial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we do have some experiments in mice that, that are ongoing, but it was really interesting, like, um, for our funders, the people that funded the research, which was um, the Maryland Stem Cell Institute and the Department of Defense uh, and also the NIH, they were actually, all three of them, much more excited about doing it in humans than in mice. I, I tend to, we tend to do mostly mouse research. Um, 
because the, it's so malleable, like um, mm -hmm. you know, when you do research in people, it's just a lot more difficult. There's a lot more regulation, of course, because we want to be safe to our and, 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 true and, and kind to our subjects. Um, so we can't, we don't have the same experimental attitude that we have and options that we have um, in mice. And so uh, we prefer, and we actually still want to do a lot of work in mice, but we find that for our funders, that they much prefer us to just immediately do things in people. And I think there's pluses and minuses of both, and it'll be fun to talk about if you want. But um, you're right. We for this, we basically jumped straight into people. Yeah, no, I was quite shocked when I read through the study because I mean, maybe I guess one of my immediate questions was how did you get people to to take part in the clinical trials. I, I mean, as you said, without the sort of more basic research uh, to build upon for the clinical study, uh, telling someone that we're going to be putting some cells from your feet into your thigh, hoping to change the structure, <laughs> maybe it might have been a bit cautious. Um, but obviously, I'm really, is, I, I guess, very grateful that people are willing to take part in studies like this because they are fundamentally really important for us, our understanding of science. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, well, the good news is um, a lot of, some work had already been, a lot of been work had been done in vitro for sure. And some work had already been done in people, even like the, um, like uh, Yamaguchi, uh, the plastic surgeon in Japan, he he had, had transplanted onto uh, people's palms, um, non-volar epidermis to show that it could, it got changed um, to, to volar epidermis when he moved it onto the, so people had already done some work on, pe on people. Uh, people had already done work on other animals, like guinea pigs, like I mentioned, uh, and the quail and duck. Just, just not a lot of mouse work, per se. There been, ha had been a little bit of mouse work, but not a huge amount. So there, there was already some good um, uh, evidence, biological evidence, to justify the study. Because you're right, there's nobody... Because we did need to get a lot of regulatory approval to do this, uh, yeah. and and the bodies that do that, like the in, the in our case, it's called the Institutional Review Board in the United States, and also the the FDA, um, the FDA um, and the IRB always make sure that there's scientific justification that this isn't just a lark and isn't kind of, doesn't have any kind of clear conceptual um, reasons why it, w it should work. Um, so the good news is that was present. Um, I think also we could make a good case for safety because we were doing an autologous study. Um, yes. So we're yeah. you put, putting the cells from one person, from one area back into their body. And then the best thing of all for safety was that there was even a product that briefly was uh, on the market that was FDA approved where um, this was maybe back in like the, not, the early 2000s, I think, where um, they wanted a treatment for, for wrinkles. Uh, and it was before these fillers had been developed. So right now in, in cosmetic dermatology, if people have some light wrinkles, they'll um, inject these, they call fillers. They, and they, the first iteration of them were collagen, but in the second iteration now is hyaluronic acid. And just they, by adding bulk to the dermis, they can, they can kind of smooth out wrinkles in the skin. But before a lot of those products really took hold, some uh, some kind of enterprising folks said, well, what, maybe we can move fibroblasts um, into those areas to make more collagen. Um, and so there was, pre and they and they got it, and it was one of the first cellular therapy products, actually. It took a long time for the FDA to approve it, but eventually they did. So the FDA already had some experience looking at safety, a lot of safety data for autologous fibroblast therapy. So. That was also safe, so that so we were able to get kind of buy-in from the funders. We were able to get buy-in from the regulatory agent agencies, and then for buy-in from the patients and our subjects uh, was also really critical. And 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 you're right; it's a real um, testament to the um, altruism and kindness of these folks that they participated. Um, and we will, as all of us in biology and in medicine and in the public, should all be very grateful, as you mentioned, Eleanor, for the, for the participation of these folks. A lot of them did it out of pure self-sacrifice because there wasn't any um, gain. There was a, a minor payment to help them with parking and stuff like that. Um, but it's, it was really pure interest in helping the, the, the world. Um, some folks were motivated because they had family members that were amputees and they thought maybe this you know can help them and then maybe eventually even 
you know, the pie in the sky dream of, of growing a new limb. Maybe we can even move in that direction. Um, and then some of them had um, family members in the armed forces. And um, we started the work around the end of uh, the United States wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And some of them had family members who were wounded in those wars or wounded in other wars um, and wanted to um, help um, their, their, um, their relatives. Um, so, so there were some, uh, and some were just straight veterans uh, who were in the armed forces previously um, and felt um, wanted to help others, other veterans. Um, and like I said, a lot of them were just motivated out, motivated out of pure interest of, of, of furthering science and medicine. So um, there, so a lot of different motivations from our subjects, um, but we're, we're, we'll always be eternally grateful for their participation. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, especially because I think this is probably one of the most exciting papers that I've read this year, at least. Um, so I think that the scientific advance is evidence. Um, just before we come back to the paper, though, I'm, I am curious about the autologous fibroblast therapy you mentioned. So this was approved in the early 2000s. Is it still existing or what happened to it? Yeah, so the, it basically they went out of business because um, it, it was a very expensive business model of doing autologous therapy, especially compared to off the shelf injections of collagen or hyaluronic acid, it was much cheaper. So, um, so, and, and so that was one of the big reasons that they, that, that they, they unfortunately uh, went out of business. I guess that kind of then leads back to your study then. And in terms of taking fibroblasts out of, let's say, the soles of the feet, that doesn't necessarily sound like the easiest thing to do. And like, what was the how many cells could you actually effectively get from uh, the patients? You're right. Yeah, it was. It, it, the study took us a long time. The, the other thing I should mention is um, this study took almost a decade. Wow. To do, okay. um, because um, uh, because of the difficulties for um, uh, regulatory approval, like the FDA application was literally like about this thick um, to get FDA uh, um, approval. Um, do getting the, um, you know, obviously the funding, um, enrolling the subjects, because it takes a long time to get the subjects. It, it has to fit their schedule. Um, you know, it's not like mice where they're always downstairs. <laughs> you, about. you know, it has to fit. It was a long study because, you know, our, our uh, we were doing time points out to two months, five months after injection. Um, but we even had one person who was lost to COVID and so we had a 17 month time point for them. Um, so uh, it was, it was very challenging. And the other time to get the other um, challenge to get what you're asking is growing up the cells took about a month. Um, so because we take a biopsy from the uh, soul, um, we start to grow up those fibroblasts. Um, we let them kind of crawl out of the tissue, which is a little bit slower, but, but easier for manpower. Um, so um, and that takes some time. And then uh, from one biopsy, we can get a lot of fibroblasts grow so well. That was the other motivation for the studies. We knew fibroblasts would, would, would be a, a good cell type that were easy to expand. So we could get to 50 million uh, cells uh, from a subject, but it, it took, you know, really at least a month. And then um, the safety testing is uh, you have to, what you do is, this is kind of interesting. After we finish the expansion, we freeze down uh, the cells for injection. But then we also freeze down some like dummy vials with cells. Um, and those vials aren't meant for the patient. But what we do is afterwards, after they're frozen down, we thaw them and make sure that if we put them in a dish that they're completely sterile and uh, nothing grows out and nothing grows out of them. Um, and it, and then and they're pure. We also test them by flow to make sure that they were 100% fibroblast cells. Um, and those studies, those like quality control studies take time too. So basically every subject, it was about like really three months almost before mm -hmm. the time we um, biopsy them for when the cells were ready. Um, and then we would do an extra like, you know, two months or five months for monitoring them or 17 months in that one, one patient. So the timelines were very, very long for each subject. Um, and the cell therapy lab at Hopkins can't, doesn't have a huge bandwidth. So we couldn't enroll a lot of patients at one time. So to get the end number that we had, which is like more around more than 30 for this paper, um, it just took us a huge amount of time. So yeah, basically this was uh, this was a, this is an example of our scientists just have to be extremely extremely um, patient and um, diligent and um, um, 
and and and, you, and like and and self sacrificing to kind of go through this whole process. Absolutely. Yeah. No. I I think it's amazing um, the diligence that's gone into this the study. Um, and so obviously now you've got your fibroblasts and you put them back into the ectopic tissue sites. What we observe is that the changes to the epidermis, so how the fibroblasts um, change the epidermis. But as you already mentioned, partly there's bidirectional communication going on. And you've now put these fibroblasts from the soles of the feet into a new environment, so new ECM, new surrounding cells. So I guess I'm curious as to what happened to the fibroblasts themselves, like how did they change over time? And were they accepted or did they change their cell identity? Or I know that there maybe wasn't so much your interest in this study, but I'm curious to know if you did observe anything. Yeah, no, no, no that's a super insightful question. Yeah, and we were really uh, fascinated by this too, is um, yeah, nothing is in isolation in biology. Like uh, there's always kind of crosstalk um, that goes all the arrows in biology go in both directions and if it, probably all of all of bio probably all of science and physics too that's a classic thing where the direction of time and all physics experiments can go backwards or forwards like um so i think um you know the directions in science always go both ways um and um and in, and in this system it's no different um and um in addition to like we're saying that the polar fibroblasts kind of influencing the epidermis of the host their new host the host is going to be affecting those donor cells. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, what we definitely noticed that where um, where we were curious about the, the fate of the cells and we knew very well uh, the gene expression of the volar fibroblasts in a dish and and and, and, and natively in the in volar skin. And so we could develop like a, a gene score that said, OK, this is what a volar fibroblast looks like. Um, and we could find evidence of that gene score um, being, but it looked like it would go down over time. Um, and it, so even though it was still present, even at like 17 months, uh, it was much lower than at the very beginning. So we knew there was some loss, but then very interestingly, um, uh, towards uh, in the second, in the review process, um, we had time to do some spatial transcriptomics to answer some reviewers' questions. Um, because a lot of the previous work was done by single cell RNA sequencing, where we define the exact identity of the cell. But then later on, we did spatial transcriptomics. And um, that allowed us to ask um, agnostically to cell um, identity and just look at cell density. Um, and we could find that the fibroblast cell density was a lot higher after we injected the cells compared to the vehicle. Um, and that, and we could look at that increased number of cells, um, and it was much higher than the volar score cells in the single cell RNA sequencing. So it was, it was kind of a, a subtle analysis, but it was really ex very, very interesting and provocative to us in that it implied that what's happening is that it, there isn't cellular loss per se, the cells are sticking around, but they're probably being co-opted by the local environment and being reprogrammed mm -hmm. um, by the cells around them to be less volar fibroblast like um, and that's a super interesting question that we're very interested in right now yeah i mean well me too but um i guess the other reason why this is an important question in terms of therapeutic application is if you are trying to give this to amputee patients an important question is to address the longevity of the treatment so how often would you have to give them these volar fibroblasts or is it one treatment would be sufficient to reprogram the fate? Um, I guess, yeah, these are sort of questions that, uh, in your opinion at the moment, how long do you think one therapy might be effective for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's a really fun question. Um, uh, yeah, and so although we can see um, the cellular persistence, um, we know that there's a lot of cellular loss for sure, like you said. And we also know that the cell conversion, um, the, the cell, the, the tissue identity conversion was not complete. So well, after we injected these cells, we didn't get to that. We didn't get to 100 percent of that thickness we normally see in volar skin. We just kind of all the all the all the variables moved in that direction, but they didn't completely change skin identity. So there's definitely still a lot of work to do uh, on, on on optimizing this therapy. Um, and so and the other thing. To, part of that is going to be asking how can we 
enhance um, engraftment uh, and prevent um, reprogramming uh, from the surrounding cells. Um, and so right now, I mean, the, we are doing studies um, in uh, amputees. Um, the injections that we did for this, we did a bunch of testing for, to optimize the outcomes uh, for this first study. And uh, we basically found that it was better, for example, to do uh, divided dosing, not giving all the cells at once, but giving the cells on like Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's what we did um, for the study for the majority of the patients. So we found that there was some suggestions that that worked a little bit better. Um, and there's been suggestions in other, other for other folks we'd heard uh, in mesenchymal stem cells where they found similar things uh, from like a group of Miami, for example. Um, and so um, we thought that that, that that was one thing. So we do know it requires multiple injections at the beginning for sure. Um, and then um, whether it, whether maybe several, like th there's so many variables to test. We never tried doing booster injections, maybe like several months later. Um, because you could imagine that maybe with enough booster injections, you could completely change 100% the fibroblasts um, to be a volar fibroblast phenotype. Um, and then that way might be an extremely effective therapy. So um, I think there are some like brute force ways that that could maybe work with like multiple booster injections. But we think it's going to be better to go back to the drawing board and understand some of the biology here to improve the therapy um, with second iterations, uh, rather than kind of doing some of these brute force methods. So we are testing in ABTs and we're doing like divided dosing at that beginning, that initial injection also, because we're curious in amputees if like maybe the pressure location might actually enhance engraftment and enhance identity maintenance. So we think there's a lot of reasons to continue testing the study and, and a phase two study on actual amputees because of that unique uh, cellular environment with more pressure that's gonna happen. Um, but fundamentally, we think it's very, it's going to be very important to do continued um, improvements to try to look at some of these deeper biological questions to make it a better therapy. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, um, well, the one immediate question is, I think you've sort of touched upon it, is if there is a better method to, to change the cell identity, uh, the tissue identity, I should say, whether just doing a whole graftment would be better than just having the fibroblasts. Obviously, from a technical perspective, that's more challenging in terms of getting the graft in the first place and making it autologous for the patient. Um, but I think to sort of backtrack more to the biology, what what really makes the follow fibroblast the follow fibroblast? Is it all just down to epigenetic differences? Because um, I think the other question about speaking about how the identity of the fibroblast might change in a new environment is. Why, why is that information kept within a cell? Is it really just a matter of changing the epigenetic patterns and gene expression? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it, epigenetics has got to be the solution here. I think that's, I completely agree, Eleanor. Um, and, um, and, and how that epigenetics gets reprogrammed, I think is an extremely interesting question. Um, and it's a very fundamental one in biology. And I think we can, this is an example of where we could try to maybe tap into a deeper biological question that has a lot of ramifications um, to ask, like, what are the cues uh, for reprogramming epigenetics? And, and that's what Yamanaka, and that's the cool thing what Yamanaka did, like, um, is like finding a way to completely reprogram the epigenetics uh, of, of a fibroblast to become like an embryonic stem cell. And, uh, and I think kind of asking us, and he found, his, you know, a special cocktail um, and, and the question here is going to be, what is the native cocktail? So what is the cocktail occurring in normal people's skin that's reprogramming the epigenetics of these cells? Um, and I think that, that's going to be a really, really fun question to get at. Um, and, um, and, you know, I, we're, we're really interested in trying to look at that. Um, and, and so that those are experiments that are actively ongoing right now. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I look forward to hearing more about it. Um, but maybe now to go more to another project that you mentioned about this wound-induced hair regeneration. Um, I'm very curious to find out more about that um, as, I guess, wound repair or something, as I mentioned, declines with age. And it's something that um, I find interesting because when the, the tissue repairs a wound, it's now creating new ECM components, new collagen molecules. And things like ECM components, a lot of these proteins are very long-lived. So the process of wounding itself 
is a regenerative process. It's making new structures. In many ways, it could also be seen as a rejuvenative, anti-aging sort of approach. So this concept of wound-induced hair regeneration is very interesting. And would you be able to elaborate exactly on what your lab is doing with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Happy to. Um, and and we definitely have overlapping interests with yours about aging and regenerative potential. So, um, there was a. Uh, a former postdoc in my laboratory who's I'm now very much independent and running his own laboratory and doing really exciting work in a lot of areas. Uh, his name is Sush Dr. Sashank Reddy. Um, Sashank's an MD PhD uh, here at Hopkins in the plastic surgery department. Um, and he's um, uh, he learned he did some win assays with us and helped us define the role of the innate immunity uh, in, in uh, triggering a lot of hair follicleogenesis and specifically recognition of double-stranded RNA that normally is from viruses, but can interestingly trigger um, hair follicle regeneration. Um, so he helped a lot of those foundational studies we did in our lab. Now in his own lab, he's looking at how aging impacts uh, hair follicle neogenesis, and it certainly inhibits it for sure. And he's got very exciting new data. They're, they're getting close to submitting on mechanisms of why aging is causing uh, decreased regenerative potential. So keep an eye out for, for work from Dr. Reddy on that exact topic. Um, but uh, fundamentally, um, I completely agree with you that there's going to be a role for ECM here. Um, that's not a huge component of what Dr. Reddy is looking at himself right now, but that's a really exciting question. We're uh, interested in pursuing more in the future. Who knows? I don't know if you know we can work together. On this, but, <laughs> but basically, um, what we know is that in humans, um, if you take that, um, this is some really exciting work that they did, for example, at the University of Michigan a long time ago, uh, with a guy named David Fisher, and and my current chairman was involved in the studies, Dr. Simon Kong, and then uh, this guy uh, John Voorhees. They were, um, and then a, another person named uh, Dr. Barana. Uh, they were um, taking, they could see that in, uh, in very old pre people's skin, the fibroblasts uh, had an aging, a clear aging phenotype, an senescent phenotype, um, with um, uh, you know, very high production, for example, of MMPs uh, and very low production of collagens. They could take those cells, um, they could compare like a, a young person and the young person cells uh, would have um, comparatively the opposite. They would have uh, high collagen production and low MMPs from a young person in situ. And they would, they would take those cells out and put them in a dish. And now the old person and the young person cells are indistinguishable. That just by moving them into a dish out of the, uh, their environment, the cells lost a lot of their aging phenotype. Um, it was some really beautiful foundational studies they did. And I think with, to me what that implies, and I think also to, the, to, to, the, to these investigators, was that the local environment was part of stimulating an aging phenotype. So, and a lot of that has to be the ECM. So I think, um, you know, these, I think ECM is an extremely understudied area. I think there's a lot of very exciting ways that can probably modulate regenerative potential and, uh, and, 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 and aging phenotypes. Um, that I, so I completely agree, just to kind of go off, 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 to, uh, off topic a tiny bit, the questions you bring up are extremely exciting and important. Right now, what we're doing is um, we're looking at these, uh, we're looking more closely at this double strand RNA. So we were basically just really curious, like we can put on like a single dose of like 50 nanograms of double strand RNA, like, like uh, four days after, wound, two or four days after wounding. And then, like uh, three weeks later, we see dramatic increases of hair follicle neogenesis. Um, so we know double strand RNA is extremely potent to stimulate this process, and we're very curious about the pathway, how it's doing, and what it's turning on. Um, and so that that's what the lab is looking at now. We we just had a paper um, that's close to acceptance uh, journal of clinical investigation, so people can keep an eye out for that of looking at at this double strand RNA uh, response. Oh, cool. No, I definitely will. Um, I mean, cause the reason I think I'm interested in it as well is there is some overlap with senescent cells also having sort of similar innate immune responses and senescent cells are also known already to play a role in wound repair. So I guess there is potentially an overlap in uh, the same pathways that might be activated in these uh, separate uh, experiments. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. 
like and up to now we've mostly been looking at the uh for that project we've mostly mostly been looking at the innate immune pathways in keratinocytes but at the tail end of of um this graduate student uh charlie kirby who's going to be the first author for that paper or hope that it'll uh is close to acceptance at jci um that um that work we started to uh do spatial transcriptomics and look at these same pathways, not just in keratinocytes, but also fibroblasts. And we see a lot of the same pathways happening in the fibroblasts. So, um, yeah, I, I, I agree that, and, and it's going to be this very interesting, and for us, what's an interesting kind of question is, we know that stimulating these innate immunity pathways with a pulsatile uh, stimulus that's like fast on and fast off is very good at stimulating regeneration. But it's also quite known that consistent high levels of innate immune stimulation are bad for regeneration mm -hmm. and probably do induce senescence. So it's going to be really interesting about asking like how do these different genetic programs result in these very different outcomes? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think there's so many interesting questions still in biology to be addressed. Um, I, I think to sort of wrap up our conversation, I'm more interested in, uh, I guess, your, your background as being both a sort of lab researcher, but also having this clinical exposure, like what unique insights do you think that gives you from having interaction with patients, but also uh, being very technically minded for experiments? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's a real, um, I think it's a pleasure. It's a slow, it's a slow career kind of those of us that do clinical work and research. It's a little slower than uh, some of my other colleagues that focus on one or the other because they're a little bit faster to get to where they want to go to. So it's a little bit slower. And also, you're always kind of like the idiot in the room. You always know less than your <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> less than your PhD comments, co colleagues, less than your full MD colleagues. But I think, um, but it is fun because it does allow us to look at that bridge um, of um, of, re of uh, clinical questions that might have important research implications, or research implications that can have clinical uh, research data that can have clinical implications. Um, and one example of that is a, a studies we're just starting now, where we had an MD PhD student in the lab who was really curious about this disease um, called hydradenitis suppurativa. So there's this disease that um, folks get where they get these terrible sores in their underarms and groin, um, just spontaneously that like leak pus. It's very embarrassing for these patients. Um, it's also quite painful. A lot of them quit their jobs um, because it's difficult to sit because a lot of these lesions can happen in the groin and the buttocks. Um, it's very embarrassing because they have pus like it, kind of leaking out of their body. Um, and most fascinatingly of all, the, the, um, the incidence of this, the amount of this disease we're seeing is going up a lot lately. So like when I was a resident, I saw this disease maybe just like once I, once or twice a year, like this is about 30 years ago now, uh, you know, 20, 25 years ago, I'd see it like, well, once um, very, very, very infrequently. We'd always bring it to our diagnostic conferences because it was an unusual diagnosis to share with our colleagues. But now it's a daily diagnosis. It's, so oh, wow. it's like it's becoming, it's becoming more of an epidemic now. And so to us, that implied that there was a environmental cause for it. Um, and um, we think it's actually involves fibroblasts um, in this in the skin, and um, so that was an example where we we could I could tell it was something that was environmental, and we started studying it in the lab. We're kind of um, trying to submit it to journals right now from some of our first work to look at what might be causing it, um, and um, and it's been a lot of fun to try to apply a lot of the molecular biology expertise we've honed over the years to this new disease that's becoming more common. Hmm. No, that's really interesting. I guess that's something I hadn't really thought about is by having that direct exposure to patients, you know exactly what things are becoming more prevalent and therefore where we should be putting more attention to in terms of the scientific research. Um, yeah, there's an interesting story there just to mention. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, was from Okinawa, um, since you're in Japan, just to mention this. And, um, <laughs> and in Okinawa, um, Okinawa used to be um, like in the, one of the blue zones, meaning that they would say this is where people could live the, uh, the longest in the world because of an extremely healthy lifestyle of you know eating a lot of uh, vegetables and, uh, and and fish um, with uh, with a lot of you know exercise and outdoor activity and you know a lot of the things that um, 
we associate with good health. But recently, um, interestingly in Okinawa, probably because of the, sadly, the American base and maybe the influence of American culture, sadly, there's been um, uh, increase of like um, Western diet, for example, in, Okin in parts of Okinawa. And HS is also becoming more prevalent uh, in Okinawa. This disease is also becoming more prevalent in Okinawa. So I think um, that we heard some really exciting results from one of our Japanese colleagues at the um, at our dermatology conference um, talking about um, the, the, the rates of HS uh, in, in parts of different parts of Japan. And um, that also kind of clearly indicates that there's some environmental cause that might even be related, related to our nutrition um, that's causing this disease. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a really a lot of exciting ways of applying science, like um, also international collaborations and learning from each, each other. So um, it, it's a fun way of not only being able to combine different expertise, but different geographies where we can learn about, about common, common questions. No, absolutely. Um, and I think I, one question I always like to ask people is what sort of advice would you give to other researchers or people who are interested in learning more? And I think why you just sort of said communication or collaborating with other people is really important to have a good scientific career. But what sort of other general advice uh, would you want to leave with my audience? Yeah, I would, I would say, um, believe in yourself. Um, I think like something that I did when I was young is I thought, oh, geez, like, uh, uh, I, I should just do the lowest risk thing because I, I you know, failure is so common. And, but I wasn't really believing in myself. So I think it's important. And I think a lot of times uh, trainees, because you don't, it's true, you don't know, you're still learning. It's easy to think, well, I don't, I sh to confuse that with like a lack of uh, ability. And don't do that. Don't don't confuse your status as a learner with your uh, lack of like ability, because that's because you guys are there's so many so many of you guys are so smart have so much to offer. Um, so I think um, trying to just stay true to what you love. So ask yourself just what fundamentally what do you care about? What what really interests you? What do you what do you find viscerally kind of in, attractive and enticing? Um, what, what speaks to you at kind of your, your deepest uh, level. And a lot of that intuition, I think, tends to be correct. It tends to draw you towards really important open questions. Um, and so I think listening to that voice is really, really important. Um, and then I think, uh, and then um, trying to kind of not be afraid to go off the beaten path, um, where I think a lot of people say, oh, I, you know, I really, um, want to do my postdoc at Harvard, or I really want to do my postdoc at, at like UCSF or, um, and, uh, but, but try to just think about the a fundamental question that will animate you and, and drive you. Um, because if it's a fundamental question, that's really, really important. You can take it to a new level, a new point that will really bust open the field and make, and make your career uh, successful and easier. I think what happens is, for those of us that like tend to, um, if we're too risk averse, like I was, I think at the very beginning of my career, um, I think um, what happens is we tend to make very incremental uh, uh, progress and it tends to be harder to justify to funding agencies uh, and our colleagues about the value of what we're doing. Um, but if you go off the beaten path, um, there's a real chance to make much more um, uh, larger uh, leaps and those larger leaps, I think, can um, lead to uh, bigger and bigger impact discoveries earlier on in your career that make it easier to follow. So once you, I think it's all about finding a line of inquiry that where you can mine it and continue to mine it towards new knowledge. Um, and the earlier you find that 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 lead, um, the better. And it's and a lot of that's kind of taking risks. So I think um, just being um, not, be, not like of course you want to do it with really really uh talented people so trying to kind of surround yourself with super talented people but they're not always in the same same institutions i think that's important to think about um as you kind of try to pursue some of those new questions no that's great advice and i completely resonate i think for myself um i don't know if i'll ever get to the point of knowing i'm always still in that learning phase continuously um and yeah, i think it's so right to to find the questions that really drive you as a scientist um, and I think I agree as well, having more risks. Um, I think we often play it safe because it, well, it's the safer thing to do, but 
I think we're in a position now where we should try to be a bit more ambitious. And I think that's only so evident in this late, latest paper that took you 10 years, potentially longer to, to get out. So I'm really excited to see what comes from your lab next. Um, I, as I said, I think you're addressing some really important biological questions. And I think is making me think of more questions for my own research. And I think it's just yeah, really exciting time uh, as well for research. So I can only wish you the best of luck with it. And I look forward to hearing more about it in the future. Yeah, thanks, Eleanor. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations in your science journalism here. I think, like I mentioned at the beginning, I think it's just so important to communicate uh, our results to the community um, and, and, and to lay folks um, so that they understand what we do and can help um, continue to support our, our work through government funding, for example. So. Um, yeah, and I think I agree, like science communication, the more we talk to each other, I think the more connections we'll find um, in disparate fields. So, and that can't happen without the exciting uh, work you're doing um, like in, in this um, you, you in this, in this, um, in this program. So thank you so much, Eleanor, for um, your interest and, and, and on your insightful questions. Uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun chatting with you today. Oh, excellent, my pleasure.